as I said, we need to watch, could cause some disruption. We're going to see showery rain crossing the country during Wednesday. It turns brighter and drier to the end of the week, but colder for all of us. Europe is in the grip of the most devastating humanitarian crisis since World War II. The people of Ukraine are facing unimaginable suffering. As their homes are destroyed and their loved ones are killed. Millions of people are being forced to flee for their lives, carrying only their children, their pets and the clothes on their back. The pain, loss and destruction grows by the day. The people of Ukraine urgently need our help. Already a vast humanitarian operation is underway. Britain's Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, brings together 15 leading aid charities to respond to overseas disasters quickly and efficiently. These charities include the British Red Cross, CARE, Oxfam, Save the Children and World Vision. Their teams are working on the ground in Ukraine and neighbouring countries to bring vital aid to those who need it most. If you can spare it, your gift to the DEC's humanitarian appeal will go a really long way. £10 provides essential hygiene supplies for a person for a month. £50 provides blankets for four families. £100 provides emergency food for two families per month. It's easy to give. You can donate online at dec.org.uk or call the 24-hour donation line on 0370 60 60 900. If you prefer to send a cheque, please post it to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, PO Box 999, London, EC 3A 3AA. To give £10 on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70 150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation will be added to your bill. 100% of your donation goes directly to the DEC to save lives and deliver critical support where it's needed. Hello and welcome to The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, standing in for Gloria De Piero this week. Lots coming up this hour. We've got the latest on the war in Ukraine and what more the West can do to help. And as the cost of living crisis worsens and Partygate rears its head again, polling guru Sir John Curtis will tell us how voters are feeling. We'll be talking carbon taxes as well. The government's energy plan is expected on Thursday. And Sir Keir Starmer has been leader of the Labour Party for two years today. Are they any closer to government. All that to come, but first, it's the headlines. A very good afternoon. It's 12 o'clock. I'm Rosie Wright, here to keep you up to date on GB News. The Prime Minister says the UK will continue to work with its NATO allies to ensure that Putin fails as he seeks tougher international sanctions against Russia. A spokesperson for the Ukrainian president said authorities had found what looked exactly like war crimes. Satellite images show a mass grave in the grounds of a church in Butcher. The Kremlin says it categorically denies any accusations related to the murder of civilians there. Well, President Volodymyr Zelensky says war crimes will be examined by the UN Security Council on Tuesday. I want every mother of every Russian soldier to see the bodies of dead people in Butcher, Herpin and Gostomel. How was it possible to rape women and kill them in front of their children, making fun of their bodies even after they died? Why did they crush people's bodies with tanks? What did the Ukrainian city of Bucha do to Russia? How did all of this become possible? The Foreign Secretary has announced £10 million of support for organisations working with survivors of sexual violence in Ukraine. Liz Truss is travelling to Poland to meet with her Ukrainian and Polish counterparts and aid organisations supporting Ukrainian refugees. Meanwhile, the UK's Defence Ministry says Russian forces, including mercenaries, are refocusing their offensive into the Donbass region in Ukraine. The former UK commander, Colonel Hamish de Breton Gordon, told us the response of the international community has taken Russia by surprise. What we must do now is try and sue for some sort of peace um, so that Ukraine this brave nation can uh, start rebuilding and get back on its feet. And if it means that the Russians hang on to a little bit of Ukraine in the east, then that's probably a price we'll have to pay. 
The International Trade Secretary has said the UK must eliminate Russian fuel from our energy mix once and for all. Anne-Marie Trevelyan says the UK must work with reliable energy partners to protect our supply chains and steady the global market. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has caused turmoil in global energy markets. Wales Minister Simon Hart says there's huge potential and public support for offshore wind farms in Wales. I think onshore is more complicated. I think it only works in Wales, only works in Wales, where you've got significant community buy-in, and that's a, that's a very big if. Uh, and that community buying isn't around just about turbines. It's also about the infrastructure that supports turbines. So I think public support is much more uh, noticeable in the floating offshore sector and, of course, in, in nuclear, which is where we really think we can make some significant progress relatively soon. Now, the government's former ethics chief has reportedly been fined over the Partygate scandal. The Daily Telegraph says Helen McNamara, who used to be the Deputy Cabinet Secretary, was fined £50 in connection with the leaving due held in the Cabinet Office in June 2020. Now, 20 fixed penalty notices have been issued as part of the police investigation into COVID rule-breaching parties in Westminster. For those heading overseas on what for many of us is the first day of the Easter school holidays, flights have been cancelled. Cross-channel services have also been hit by major delays. Eurotunnel is warning its rail services to Calais are delayed by three hours. British Airways cancelled at least 115 flights that had been scheduled for today. And EasyJet preemptively cancelled 62 flights too. They've blamed sickness and staff shortages on COVID. The Labour Party says the average cost of a full-time nursery place is now just over £273 a week. The Shadow Education Secretary says parents are being forced to work fewer hours or leave jobs because they cannot find or afford childcare. A government spokesperson says more than £3.5 billion has been invested, though, in free childcare in each of the last three years. Shortness of breath, having an aching body and also loss of appetite are three of nine symptoms that have newly been added to the official list of signs of COVID-19. Well, the changes were added to the NHS website and they emerged just days after free universal testing for coronavirus ended in England. Infection levels have now hit a record high in the UK, with almost five million people estimated to currently have the infection. Adults wearing face masks, that's hindered some babies' ability to understand facial expressions. Well, Ofsted report that children have been affected after being unable to see lip movements or mouth shapes when people are wearing masks. They also say children have increasingly started to use accents and voices from TV programmes, having missed out on having real-life conversations. A Department for Education spokesman says language intervention is being used in schools to try to improve the language skills of reception-age children. You're now up to date on GB News. I'll bring you more as it happens. Now, let's head to the lunchtime briefing today with Tom. Coming up this hour on The Briefing, Russia stands accused of genocide as the full horror of what soldiers have done to civilians becomes clear. I'll have the latest from a Ukrainian MP, and I'll also ask Conservative MP Andrew Rosendale what more the West can do to help. As the cost of living crisis gets even worse and details of the first party gate fines start to emerge, I'll be asking polling guru Sir John Curtis just how voters are feeling. And the government's long-awaited energy plan is expected this Thursday. Philip Dunn, chair of the Environmental Audit Committee, tells me about plans for carbon taxes for incoming gas and oil. And it's two years today since Sir Keir Starmer became leader of the Labour Party. I'll be asking how he's changed the party and how much closer to government they are now. And remember, through all of this, give me your political briefing. Send in your views and opinions by emailing gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews. Now, Western leaders have condemned Russia and are preparing new sanctions after the horrendous disco discovery that civilians were massacred on the outskirts of Kyiv. Russian troops were forced, forced to retreat from two towns on the outskirts of the city. Some victims had been murdered execution style, with others with their hands tied behind their backs and left dead in the street. There's also evidence of some women being raped, even in front of their children. 
Well, joining me now from Ukraine is Alexei Goncherenko, member of the Ukrainian parliament. Uh, thank you very much for making time for us this afternoon, uh, Alexei. Uh, first of all, I, I suppose the big question is, how is the mood in Kyiv with the Russians being forced out uh, on the positive side, but also unveiling the true horror of the atrocities that appear to have been committed on the other? Yes, it's a very bitter taste. We have a victory, a real very big victory in the battle for Kiev, and that is extremely important for the future of our country and of the whole continent. And it shows how the war will end at the, uh, at the end. But uh, yes, uh, the, the taste is very bitter because what we saw in liberated areas of Kiev region is absolutely awful. I were, I've been there personally two days, and I saw a number of bodies of killed people just lying on the streets, just in their cars. People were shooted, people were burned down. And that's so awful, I can't even, I can't even explain you when you see uh, pictures like this. I saw people uh, in Hostomel, which is uh, Hostomel, Bucha and Dirpe, three towns which were liberated, which uh, just on the, near their home, uh, private house, Russians uh, killed two people in the car. And then in the night they took their bodies and buried in their private garden. They even, they even uh, didn't know who they are, but they buried their bodies there. There are still bodies with, for one month uh, staying on the streets. I saw the, probably the most awful that I saw, I saw the car with a burnt child, probably five, six years old, maybe seven. I, I, it's, it's, it's a real horror and it's a real genocide which is committed by Russians and uh, war crimes and by Russian army. Because it's not Putin himself who was killing all these people. It was Russian soldiers and officers who did these awful things. And I think that we need, we should call it genocide. We have all the, uh, the signs of genocide here. It's extraordinary hearing you give that personal account. Of course, the videos and pictures that we've seen uh, online have been horrific enough, but seeing them in person must be just another level. I suppose when it That's comes true. to them... That's true. A lot of it is on, on my Twitter. So those who want to see it, uh, I understand it's shocking. I, I can just tell you, uh, just I need to to tell it in advance that it is shocking. But who wants to, sh to see the truth on my Twitter, please, you can do this. We certainly will. It's a very, very sad situation. I suppose documenting all of this evidence will become very, very important when it comes to yes, rightly absolutely. taking the Russians to the International we already Criminal invited, Court. We already invited prosecutors from International Criminal Court to Ukraine. And also there are like dozens of international journalists while watching it with their own eyes, seeing these mass graves just near the church where like I, see one, I saw one open grave with uh, 15, 20 bodies in just in black bags and things like this. What does it do to the spirit of the Ukrainian people to, to see such horrors? I suppose on the one hand is devastating, but on the other, it may strengthen resolve to push yes. out the Russian menace from the country certainly altogether. People, yes, certainly people are shocked, absolutely shocked. But from another hand, it's even more clear what we are fighting for, that if we would lose, they will just kill all of us and go ahead. So certainly it, it even makes us stronger that we need to win this war just to save our nation from this genocide. And I'm sure that we will do it. And I hope that the whole world, free world, will help us in this, watching these awful pictures and understanding that it could happen in other places where Russians will, uh, will, will get. So it is so impo important to stop Putin now because they are real Nazis. So what would you like to see the West do more? Obviously, there's a big debate about what kind of weaponry we can supply. The West is worried about escalating the crisis, but on the other hand, wants to do all we can do to help. I don't know where to escalate more. There's a full-scale war with such war crimes like I described you just recently. And speaking what can be done, first of all, stop all business with Russia. All business. 
stop buying oil and gas because it's a, just a big gas station of the world. Uh, stop all commercial activities with them. I think that all British companies, for example, should leave Russia and not to pay taxes in their budget because from these taxes, all this murdering is financed. And secondly, uh, what is very important is weapons. By the way, here I should say that the United Kingdom is a leader. I just I want to thank United Kingdom, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, uh, all MPs for support of Ukraine, and we are receiving a really real support from the UK, not only good words, because now, you know, one million good words, words is not worth for one rifle. So we are receiving from the UK a real support, a real weapon, and we are very thankful for this. But we hope that UK will also help to, to, to ensure others to do the same. Well, Alexei Goncharenko, thank you very much for providing that first-hand experience there for us. We really value your time this afternoon. Now, this week, Western leaders are expected to step up sanctions on Russia, and it's reported that NATO has agreed to send tanks to Ukraine. Well, joining me in the studio now to discuss Ukraine, but also the 40th anniversary of the Falklands War is Conservative MP for Romford, Andrew Rossendale. Uh, welcome to the programme. I suppose listening to that conversation with Alexei, there are parallels. There's always been the battles for freedom, for liberty, for justice. There have always been the fascistic aggressors in this world and those fighting for liberty. Do you see parallels between what happened in the Falklands 40 years ago and what's going on in Ukraine now? Tom, history repeats itself, sadly. It seems like we don't learn from what's gone before. Forty years ago, the Argentines invaded the Falkland Islands. It was an act of illegal aggression against the people there. And it's tragic. And we just heard what uh, our friend from Ukraine was saying, how appalling to see these acts of violence against innocent people yet again in a different context. The point I'd like to make is that when freedom is threatened... And when bullies need to be stood up to, I think it's Britain that's almost always there first with America and with the, our NATO allies. And 40 years ago, Mrs Thatcher showed that Britain was not going to allow the Falkland Islands to be taken by conquest. She made sure that we sent a task force to recapture those islands, to give the British Falklanders the right to determine their own destiny. And we must learn from those lessons today with Ukraine. We simply have to stand up to bullying, and this is what it is. It's wickedness that's going on in Ukraine. We're hearing about the awful atrocities that are being uh, unveil un uh, discovered. Mm. I mean, uh, it is just shocking in this day and age that these kind of things are taking place. And Britain must stand firm with our allies against it and learn from previous incidents. And today we remember the Falklands, mm. and I hope that I hope that all British people will also remember it because I think it, in many ways, it. It gave Britain a sense of purpose again. You know, we weren't in a good way before mm. 1982. And the Falklands really gave us something to stand up for again. And I think we've had a successful, generally, a successful 40 years ever since, mm. since Mrs Thatcher took that difficult decision uh, to send the task force and recapture the islands. It is fascinating to see how the UK was viewed in the world before then, even viewed internally in this country, this sense of managed decline since the end of the war, where prime minister after prime minister, no matter which party, frankly, saw their role as just managing the decline of this country, trying to make our exit from the world stage as graceful as possible. Well, the Falklands, to some extent, turned that around. Suddenly, the UK, which was seen as a, a power where other countries felt like they could but take bits off, uh, especially the Argentines. Uh, we turned that round. We stepped back up to the global uh, sphere. We were back up there in the big decision-making bodies of the world. And clearly, that spirit has lived on today when we're hearing Ukrainians thank the United Kingdom for really leading the fight there. I, I suppose that wouldn't have happened without the Falklands. Tom, you're completely right. I think that the Falkland Islands was a turning point. That conflict was a turning point. But I think it only was because you had a particular prime minister at the time who understood that if we'd given in, if we'd allowed a, a, a military dictatorship to capture the Queen's Islands, which is what they were, if we'd allowed that to happen, I think that Britain would have been diminished beyond imagination. We'd have lost our way completely. And she knew that everything depended on that. And she had to fight the global community, as always, looking for a, a, a peace solution 
even though aggression has taken place. And I don't believe in that. I think that if aggression has taken place, you have to stand up to those people. Mm. You, you can't let them win. And she was absolutely clear that we couldn't let Argentina win. Had we not done that then, had our magnificent armed forces not sailed uh, all those miles to the Falklands, rescued the people of the Falkland Islands, mm. uh, not only would Britain have been diminished, but the democracy we now see in Latin America would never have occurred. And I think we'd have unleashed dictatorships around the world to capture lands and territories and islands that they thought was theirs. Uh, so Mrs Thatcher, we owe a huge debt of gratitude for, not only for rescuing the Falklands, restoring pride to Britain, but also helping to bring freedom and democracy around the world, which culminated in the fall of the Berlin Wall, mm. at the end of the Cold War, if, if only we we had more leaders like that today. Well, I wonder, looking at those parallels to today, because clearly that resolve to not appease aggressors, that's been present within the United Kingdom. Since 2015, we were training Ukrainian uh, armed forces. We've trained over 22,000 of them. We were sending uh, defensive weaponry, anti-tank missiles, as early as January. All the while, countries like Germany were steadily importing more Russian oil and gas and refusing to send weaponry to Ukraine. Is there a difference in mindset here? Are we as a people more likely now to stand up to those aggressors? Well, actually, Tom, you, you've hit on something very important to me because one of the reasons I wanted to leave the European Union is because they have great ambitions, you know, to have a European defence and sideline NATO. I frankly don't think that the European countries in general, there are some exceptions, but Germany in particular, they simply look after their own interests. Now, we sacrifice we make huge sacrifices to defend the freedom of other countries. We've done that for generations. My father fought in the Royal Air Force. My grandfather's uh, fought in the First World War in the army. Uh, we know in this country what it's like to fight and die for freedom. Mm. Uh, generations have done this. And we not only do it to defend our own people, but other people as well. We have a proud record as a nation. Mm. And I think that what really worries me is that future generations don't always understand this. They're mm. being fed a lot of woke stuff in schools uh, and, and told almost to dislike their own country. And, and I, I really do think that that's a big problem uh, mm. today in I've, making I've been, sure young people understand this. I've been struck by the media when it comes to the reporting of this conflict. We, we hear today about how the Ukrainian people are supporting Britain. Or, uh, we see opinion polls remarkably conducted within Ukraine that show the popularity of the United Kingdom compared to other countries. Mm. We see the speech from President Zelensky just yesterday who, who condemned Angela Merkel and Nicolas Sarkozy uh, for their appeasement of Russia and explicitly praised the United Kingdom Prime Minister. Why on earth is the media not reporting the true facts on the ground there in terms of how the Ukrainian people see the United Kingdom? All I see from so many newspapers and broadcasters is how bad the United Kingdom is and how little we're doing, when mm. the opposite seems to be the case in the minds mm. of the Ukrainian people. Uh, Tom, I wish I knew. I, I find it atrocious that, that so many people, particularly in the media, not GB News, of course, but many in the media uh, always seem to be downgrading Britain's contribution, not actually giving Britain the credit for what we always do, which is to stand up for freedom and democracy and the rights of people. And yes, I think it's appalling that we're not ensuring that the British people understand this because too many people seem to have a down on our own country. Mm. And this is going to lead us nowhere. This is going to lead to division within our own society if this carries on. Mm. And so, as I said earlier, those people in the media, in the establishment, in the educational establishment particularly, mm. who seem to be looking for ways of beating Britain, beating up Britain and doing Britain down rather than promoting the incredible force for good in the world that we are and always have been. These people are really harming our mm. country and teaching our younger people to dislike their own nation. And I do think that we as politicians, and I know that GB News is always promoting Britain and standing up for the truth about how what a success we are as a country, I mm. think we need to do more of it, this mm. and shout more loudly. Oh, absolutely. While we, of course, believe in speaking about the uncomfortable truths that there are contemporarily and historically, uh, there also has to be space for speaking up for the good that we have do done and are doing in the world. Andrew Rossendale, thank you so much for thank joining so. us here this afternoon on The Briefing. Well, there was Andrew Rossendale talking through the Falklands and Ukraine, of course. After the break, we'll be speaking to Sir John Curtis and what the state of the polls are for the government. We'll be back in just a moment.
Europe is in the grip of the most devastating humanitarian crisis since World War II. The people of Ukraine are facing unimaginable suffering. As their homes are destroyed and their loved ones are killed. Millions of people are being forced to flee for their lives, carrying only their children, their pets and the clothes on their back. The pain, loss and destruction grows by the day. The people of Ukraine urgently need our help. Already a vast humanitarian operation is underway. Britain's Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, brings together 15 leading aid charities to respond to overseas disasters quickly and efficiently. These charities include the British Red Cross, CARE, Oxfam, Save the Children and World Vision. Their teams are working on the ground in Ukraine and neighbouring countries to bring vital aid to those who need it most. If you can spare it, your gift to the DEC's humanitarian appeal will go a really long way. £10 provides essential hygiene supplies for a person for a month. £50 provides blankets for four families. £100 provides emergency food for two families per month. It's easy to give. You can donate online at dec.org.uk or call the 24-hour donation line on 0370 60 60 900. If you prefer to send a cheque, please post it to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, PO Box 999, London, EC 3A 3AA. To give £10 on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70. 150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation will be added to your bill. 100% of your donation goes directly to the DEC to save lives and deliver critical support where it's needed. Welcome back. Now, the local elections are just a month away. Prices are soaring as the cost of living crisis worsens and Partygate is back in the news as details of those first fixed penalty notices begin to come out. Well, as, that, uh, as those twin stories affect us, how much do voters care about Partygate? Well, there's no, no one better to tell us what the people of Britain think, then polling guru Sir John Curtis, of course, and I'm delighted that he joins us now. Uh, welcome to the programme, Sir John. I suppose, first of all, the polls have told an interesting story for the last couple of weeks. We've seen a relative narrowing of the gap between the Tory party and the Labour party compared to a month or two ago. To what extent have, in recent days, the new Partygate revelations sought to knock that? Well, the truth is, Tom, I, by my reckoning, we've only had a couple of polls since uh, Partygate re-emerged as a story uh, in the middle of last week. One of them has Conservatives down a couple of points. The other one has the Conservatives up a point. Um, and I think, in truth, probably on the evidence we've got so far, uh, we have to conclude that probably the latest Partygate stories have not had that much impact. Of course, one has to bear in mind here is that all we've learned so far is that there were a that they referred to a couple of parties, one in the cabinet office, one in Ten Downing Street, but not in the flat. Neither of them events attended by the prime minister. Um, and while, sure, the stories of the last week or so have given uh, the media the opportunity uh, or uh, the reason to remind people of the Partygate story, insofar as it, the, the, the story so far has not got the Prime Minister in particular ensnared in its graphs once more, um, I suspect that we shouldn't be surprised. It doesn't have that much impact. Now, the only thing one can say is that what is true is that the call for the Prime Minister to resign has tempered to a degree. So we're now looking amongst the electorate as a whole, most polls are around 50% of people so saying he should resign, whereas uh, in the middle of January it was three-fifths, sometimes a bit more. And amongst those who voted Conservative in 2019, the portion who thinks he should resign has gone down from about 40% or so in many polls to 30%, possibly even less. So it's also clear at the moment 
that the call for the Prime Minister to resign has weakened. And the Prime Minister's personal popularity in pretty much now back to where it was before Partygate broke, before the Owen Patterson affair story started, but still much weaker than it was 12 months ago. So, mm -hmm. yes, the Conservatives are not, and Boris Johnson personally are not in this difficult position. Partygate at the moment is not paying as much of a demand for him to resign as it once was. But I think we should remember back at the beginning of January, we were again in a situation where Partygate was out of the news. And Mr. Johnson's personal position uh, uh, standing improved somewhat in the polls. Then we had another wave of revelations, including revelations involving the Prime Minister, and things went back to where they had been in December. So I think the crucial thing is what happens if, and of course at the moment it's very, very much an if, uh, the Prime Minister himself becomes a person involved primarily because uh, he, himself, he, he in the end uh, faces a fine. And we're clearly not in that position. We may not be in that position for quite some time. We're, we're, reading, we're hearing that the Metropolitan Police are now off interviewing witnesses, perhaps before the issue very much in the way of fines. And that perhaps may uh, in, well involve any events that might potentially involve the Prime Minister. It's remarkable to hear you say that the Prime Minister's personal ratings are back up to November 2021, before even the Owen Paterson affair. That is something that I hadn't noticed before. It does speak to potentially quite a fickle British public. Depending on what the media is talking about, they will uh, sway one way or the other. Is that a fair assumption? Are we uh, are polls potentially not all that reflective if we're talking about taking a poll in the middle of a media storm potentially would that poll be maybe less representative than we might at first think oh well i think it's certainly true like all good cheese tom that uh, it, we we get the true taste of what it really means when it's had the chance to age for a while um, instant polls are fun but they're not always the most reliable long-term indicator I and mean, I would say two things to you. Look, the, first, the, the honest truth is, is that Boris Johnson has never been a particularly popular prime minister. That's for one very obvious reason, which is that while he is very popular and once upon a time was particularly popular amongst Leave voters, he has always been unpopular amongst Remain voters. And he's certainly been unpopular amongst Remain voters ever since January 2020. So he's, he's been a He's at best always been a divisive prime minister, very popular with half of the country, but not with the other half. Whereas some other prime ministers like Margaret Thatcher, which we were talking about previously, um, or Tony Blair uh, until the Iraq war, um, had uh, periods when they were wide-ranging popular. We're still talking about a prime minister uh, of whom more people are dissatisfied, uh, of whom few, fewer people approve of his record mm. than think of him uh, 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 favorably or think of, or, uh, mm. Approval of his record. So he, I mean, we're not talking about Boris Johnson being popular. We're simply talking about Boris Johnson recovering from a particular bout of unpopularity that, yes, was there at the height of a media storm. And what we don't know is whether or not it would return if indeed the media storm mm. has reason to come back again. And I think that very much depends on whether or not the Prime Minister himself becomes personally implicated. One interesting thing I've read in recent days is that the Remain Leave identity of voters seems to be ebbing away quite a bit. There was a time when the identity as a Leave voter or a Remain voter was stronger than party identity. People felt like they were a Brexiteer or a Remain voter more than they felt like they were a Conservative or a Labour voter. Uh, the fact that that seems to be ebbing away now, that the salience of Brexit as an issue seems to be diminishing, does that help or harm the Prime Minister? <laughs> well, I think the first thing to say on the premise of your question, it's still the case that people are much more likely to say they're a Remainer or a Lever and to say they're a very strong Remainer or a Lever than they are to say they're a very strong Conservative Labour or anything else. Yes, the proportion of people who feel that way has diminished, but we're still quite remarkably talking about a situation where the proportion of people who say they are very strong Remainer or Lever is the kind of level of uh, strength of partisan identity that we've not seen since the 1960s. Yes, it's gone down to a degree, but it's still much stronger than, than it is for the parties. But as far as Boris Johnson's... Well, I mean, the other thing to say is that if you look at the other way of looking at this, which is look at the degree to which 
people's vote preference um, reflects how they voted in 2016. It's not as strong now as it was in December 2019, but it is still as strong as it was in 2017 and therefore stronger than it was in 2015. So again, it's weakened, but it's still with us. So far as Boris Johnson's concerned, well, uh, the truth is, I think the weakening of Brexit identity and certainly the, the, the link between support for uh, Brexit and willingness to vote for the Conservatives, that is probably to his disadvantage. You have to remember that the reason why Boris Johnson won his overall majority was because he was able to unite the Leave vote behind him, with you know, mm. actually over 80% of people who were currently in favour of Leave voting for the Conservatives. Now, at the moment, we're in a situation where the proportion of Leave voters backing the Conservatives, which is around 55%, mm. is not much different from the proportion of Remain voters who are backing the Labour Party. And the fact, therefore, that Brexit isn't necessarily putting Leave voters into the Conservative camp, I think, is to the Conservative disadvantage. Because Labour, yes, they've gained yeah. some ground amongst Leave voters, um, but they're still very heavily reliant on Remain voters. Mm. Um, actually, the Conservatives, at the end of the day, if they're going to win the next election, will probably need to be more popular amongst Leave voters than mm. Labour are amongst Remain voters. And that is not the position moment, which is why... Labour are still enjoying something like a three and a half to four point lead in the polls. Right. And we have now had for the first time from November onwards, the first sustained period in this parliament of Labour being ahead, although certainly not ahead by the kind of levels mm. that previous opposition parties have been that have yes. eventually gone on to win the next general election. Between parties and wars and cost of living and even Brexit, there, is so many, there are so many moving parts to this picture. It's a, it's a fool's game, I suppose, to try and guess who will, uh, who will win in May. But for now, Sir John Curtis, thank you so much for joining us here on The Briefing this afternoon. No doubt we'll talk to you nearer those elections as well. Well, after the short break, we'll be talking about much more political news. But first, it's your headlines. It's 12.34. I'm Rosie Wright, here to keep you up to date on GB News. Now, the Prime Minister says Britain will never waver from supporting our friends in Ukraine as he seeks tougher international sanctions against Vladimir Putin's Russia. The comments come after a spokesperson for the Ukrainian president said authorities had found exactly what looked like war crimes. The Foreign Secretary has announced £10 million of support for organisations working with survivors of sexual violence in Ukraine. Liz Truss is travelling to Poland to meet with her Ukrainian and Polish counterparts in, in Warsaw. She's also going to meet aid organisations supporting Ukrainian refugees. The government's former ethics chief has reportedly been fined over the Partygate scandal. The Daily Telegraph says Helen McNamara was fined £50 in connection with the leaving due held in the Cabinet Office in June 2020. The Prime Minister's spokesperson says Boris Johnson has not been fined. The Labour Party says the average cost of a full-time nursery place is now just over £273 a week. The Shadow Education Secretary says parents are being forced to work fewer hours or leave jobs because they cannot find or afford childcare. A government spokesperson says more than £3.5 billion has been invested in free childcare in each of the last three years. For those heading overseas on the first day of the Easter holidays, flights have been cancelled, cross-channel services have been hit by major delays. Eurotunnel is warning its rail services to Calais are delayed by three hours. British Airways cancelled at least 115 flights that have been scheduled to take off today. And EasyJet preemptively scheduled 62 flights that were also set to depart today. They've blamed sickness and staff shortages and said that's from coronavirus. You're up to date on GB News, but on your TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. Shortly, we'll be back to the briefing. Europe is in the grip of the most devastating humanitarian crisis since World War II. The people of Ukraine are facing unimaginable suffering. As their homes are destroyed and their loved ones are killed. Millions of people are being forced to flee for their lives, carrying only their children, their pets and the clothes on their back. The pain, loss and destruction grows by the day. The people of Ukraine urgently need our help. Already a vast humanitarian operation is underway. Britain's Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, 
brings together 15 leading aid charities to respond to overseas disasters quickly and efficiently. These charities include the British Red Cross, CARE, Oxfam, Save the Children and World Vision. Their teams are working on the ground in Ukraine and neighbouring countries to bring vital aid to those who need it most. If you can spare it, your gift to the DEC's humanitarian appeal will go a really long way. £10 provides essential hygiene supplies for a person for a month. £50 provides blankets for four families. £100 provides emergency food for two families per month. It's easy to give. You can donate online at dec.org.uk or call the 24-hour donation line on 0370 60 60 900. If you prefer to send a cheque, please post it to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, PO Box 999, London, EC 3A 3AA. To give £10 on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70 150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation will be added to your bill. 100% of your donation goes directly to the DEC to save lives and deliver critical support where it's needed. Welcome back. Now, the Environmental Audit Committee has published a report today calling on the government to establish a carbon border to prevent, to prevent the UK's aim for net zero emissions being undermined by cheaper foreign imports. Putting a price on imported carbon can incentivise sectors to move away from those carbon intensive practices and promote behaviour to change to more low carbon products. Well, joining me now to discuss this more is Philip Dunn, the chair of the Environmental Audit Committee. Welcome to the programme. I, I suppose, first of all, the UK tries to put a price on carbon in many different ways. We've got different sectoral approaches. It's a very complicated picture. This proposal, adding a, a carbon border adjustment mechanism, would this not further complicate an already complicated picture? Well, I think the main point of it, Tom, is to try to provide uh, uh, less disincentive to UK manufacturing. So at the moment, we have uh, an emissions trading scheme for UK manufacturers, but 43% of our, our to territorial production emissions um, are missed because these come from uh, imports. So it's trying to level up the playing field for British manufacturers and to reduce the risk of carbon leakage uh, to offshore jurisdictions. So we think it's a, it's a fairness issue uh, for, for the UK and for consumers. Yes, it would be complicated, but uh, this is why we've been calling for the government to start consulting on this topic because it's coming round the corner. The EU have announced that they're going to introduce a carbon border adjustment mechanism um, by the end of 2023. There's an initial discussions going on within government, but it's not really been aired with the with the public, with consumers, with uh, with manufacturers. And we think we need to to get on and do that. And that's really why we published this report to raise awareness to start uh, the, the conversation going. Of course, and I suppose carbon leakage is a very important subject because, of course, if we decarbonise an industry here, stop making something and then only import that thing that's made in China or elsewhere, the same amount of carbon is going into the planet's atmosphere or maybe even more if it's done in a it's country with, more, indeed, with fewer regulations. We've already got much higher standards than apply in many other countries. So it needs to be done in conjunction with standard setting and really ideally on a multilateral basis with other trading blocks uh, and because of our role both as continuing president of COP26 until November and because we've come out of the EU we are negotiating trade agreements right across the world at the moment. We, we're in a good place to start raising this issue you know, within the rules of the WTO uh, with the different trading blocks who are starting to look at this in particular the EU but also others. Um, and, and now is the time to get our heads around what are the issues that are going to affect uh, UK manufacturers and producers. 
I think that intellectually, a lot of people can understand, particularly from a pro-market perspective, putting a price on carbon is a good market mechanism by which we can discount the externalities of higher carbon emissions. However, when it comes to deploying these sort of processes in practice, there are a lot of worries that it might look like protectionism for example, just to make imports more expensive, maybe even increasing prices for consumers who are already facing a cost of living crisis. How do we square that circle? Well, I think you're, you're right that people may have that concern. And certainly we're not arguing that this has to come in uh, today. This is not going to exacerbate the immediate cost of living crisis. What we're calling for is for the, the government to start a consultation by the end of this year and for the Chancellor to announce in uh, budget next year, 2023, uh, what his, his uh, ob objectives are uh, in trying to bring introdu introduce such a measure. We know that, it, that the EU are planning to introduce such a measure from the end of 2023, as I've already said. So you know, we've got a couple of years to get this uh, worked out and to try and implement something ideally in tandem with other trading blocks so it's done on a multilateral basis rather than the UK um, mm. uh, sort of forging ahead on its own. Well, talking about taking time to get things worked out, it was over a month ago now that the Prime Minister promised the energy strategy would be appearing within days. Why, in your view, has this long-awaited energy strategy been quite so long-awaited? Well, I, I don't know. You'd have to ask somebody in the government as to what the debate that has been going on. But clearly there has been a, a debate, I imagine, between uh, base and the Treasury as to how what the final details of this might look like. Um, I called on the Prime Minister in the Liaison Committee last week uh, to to spell out what, what the energy strategy is going to be uh, and how it's going to fit within the government's wider net zero ambitions. And I'm pleased to say he was very forthright in saying that he absolutely intends no watering down of net zero Britain uh, through the energy security strategy. And that, you know, the current indications are that it may come out uh, later this week. Certainly. Uh, we're, we're thinking it will come out on Thursday. I suppose, uh, from an environmental audit perspective, what are the key tenets of that strategy that you would like to see announced? Well, we've done very well as a country at reducing our emissions in our energy generation, reducing reliance on fossil fuels. We've phased out coal. But undoubtedly, there is a, uh, there is a continuing need for fossil fuels, for oil and gas during the transition to generation from renewables and nuclear. So first off, I'm expecting to see a significant uh, emphasis on nuclear generation uh, because as it takes eight to 10 years to get nuclear plants up and running, you know, the, the confidence needs to be established, the, um, the, the structures, the types of uh, system, both, both from a technological and a funding perspective, uh, that all needs to be in place. And the sooner that's agreed, the, the quicker uh, it will be to be able to get uh, op operations up and running, which is very important. So that's a key plank. Another is the scope for, um, for renewables, both offshore wind and tidal energy, where the government has made a, an encouraging announcement last autumn. I'd like to see a lot more there because I think we've got huge potential for the UK for tidal energy, which doesn't rely uh, on the wind or the sun, uh, and also obviously solar. So I think renewable energy has an important part to play, but fossil fuels will need to be there during the transition. And I would like to see us focusing more on uh, on the UK, on U exploiting remaining UK assets rather than relying on imports from volatile parts of the world. Um, and we, as a committee, have just announced uh, again at the end of last week that we'll be doing an inquiry into uh, what can be done in relation to uh, remaining oil and gas reserves in the North Sea on the UK continental shelf um, and how those can be extracted again in accordance with our net zero ambitions without breach. limits. Yes, well, I think there'll be a lot of support there for using our own hydrocarbons rather than relying on nefarious dictatorships around the world, at least in our transition. Well, Philip Dunn, for now, thank you very much for joining us and talking through those important issues for everyone. Well, it's also been two years now since Sir Keir Starmer got elected leader of the Labour Party. It was months after winning that contest that he came up with the slogan, the Labour Party is under new management. And, of course, he suspended Jeremy Corbyn after the Equality and Human Rights Commission report on anti-Semitism. 
He has reshaped his shadow cabinet and is currently polling just ahead of the Conservatives. Well, joining me now to talk through his two years, uh, Keir Starmer's two years, that is, as Labour Party leader, is Tony Diver, the Whitehall correspondent for The Telegraph. Welcome to the programme, Tony. I suppose, first of all, Keir Starmer started from a very low base. The Conservatives were miles ahead. It's been uh, a, a tough ride, given the multiple scandals and the number of times that actually Sir Keir himself has had to isolate away from the public due to contracting COVID or being around those who have. Uh, how do you rate uh, on your scorecard how Sir Keir Starmer has done in his first two years? Well, I think you're right. I think he had a very difficult job to begin with. Uh, and one of the main problems was that a lot of the country didn't really trust Jeremy Corbyn, they didn't really trust the Labour brand anymore. Um, and he had to convince people on basically every single policy issue that Labour had changed and they were a different party. Um, and I think, I mean, I think the poll ratings show that he has done that. I think the poll ratings show that he's got his own brand. People consider the Labour Party to be under new management, something they didn't really believe when he first said it two years ago. Um, I, I, yeah, I, think, I mean, I think give, give him an 8 out of 10. Interesting that uh, Sir Keir Starmer has been trying to distance himself from Corbyn, Corbynism, momentum. There's been internal elections, there have been suspensions and all the rest of it. But the Conservative Party keeps saying that Sir Keir Starmer, that Angela Rayner, that most of that front bench there campaigned to put Jeremy Corbyn in Downing Street for five long years. Boris Johnson has a point there, doesn't he? Well, I mean, it's a simple matter of electoral politics, isn't it? That of course you campaign to put your own leader in Downing Street. That's what happens at a general election. Um, so yeah, I mean, Boris Johnson knows full well that the general public don't trust Jeremy Corbyn, didn't like Jeremy Corbyn, and, and the majority of people didn't vote for him. So it's politically convenient for him to compare the two of them and to, and to put them into the same boat. I mean, I think Keir Starmer is demonstrated that there are some issues on which he and Corbyn were aligned, uh, and there are some in which they weren't. There are some things that Jeremy Corbyn agreed in his shadow cabinet, which due to collective responsibility, Keir Starmer and some of his front benches signed up to, which have now been abandoned and the party's gone in a new direction. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you were Boris Johnson, would you not also be trying to tie the current Labour leader to the, to the, le the less popular one that came before him? Mm. Well, Tony Diver, a, a story that you broke a number of weeks ago, a number of months ago now, actually, was that, uh, that event within Downing Street, of course, one that Boris Johnson did not attend, but one attended by many of his senior staff uh, the night before the funeral of the Duke of Edinburgh. It's now transpired that fi fixed penalty notices have been sent out with regard to that event. Uh, but we haven't seen all that much move in the polls. Do you think there'll be a distinction between how the public see the events that were attended by the Prime Minister versus those that were not? Yes, I mean, the question here is how much does it damage Boris Johnson, not how much does it damage civil servants that we've never heard of or may even never hear their names. Um, and for Boris Johnson, he's also got other stuff going on which he's currently performing quite well at, right? Uh, the Partygate scandal was big for the Prime Minister because uh, COVID was the big news issue of the day and people were still very upset about the time that they'd spent uh, in lockdown when people in number 10 were partying and seemingly having a good time. Uh, it seems like we've moved a bit beyond that now. Simon Hart, the wealth secretary, said this morning that he thought people were kind of over it. I don't think that's quite true. I think people still care about it, but there are other big issues in the news. I mean, the war in Ukraine being the most obvious one, cost of living being another. Um, I think if Boris Johnson is fined and is found to have broken the laws that he himself set, uh, mm. that will damage the Conservative Party, it will damage their brands and it will damage his, the public sense of his own integrity. Uh, but I think, yeah, I think, I think the Partygate scandal does look a lot less potent than it did a few mm. months ago. I suppose it all hinges on whether Boris Johnson himself gets one of those notices or not. But that is to be uh, waited upon, I suppose. Tony Diver, thank you for joining us, of course, Whitehall correspondent for The Telegraph there. Well, a case is being heard today in the Royal Court, Belfast, that is trying to stop an amnesty for all troubles-related cases in Northern Ireland. The historical cases heard till now have mainly seen state forces being brought back for examination with no convictions. Many say the prosecutions are one-sided, and now the British government are pushing for an end to all such court actions. Well, here to explain more is our Northern Ireland reporter, Doogie Beatty. Doogie. What is exactly going on in court today? 
Well, this is uh, Patricia Burns and Daniel McCready have taken a case, well, an appeal against an appeal, I suppose, to try and get a judicial review to stop the British government um, imposing this blanket amnesty. Now, this amnesty will stop any further cases being looked at that were in relation to the Troubles prior to 1998. This is a very controversial um, piece of, of legislation that's trying to get through because, as you've pointed out in, in your introduction there, the only people that are being asked to appear for crimes, if you like, are the state forces. 60% of the killings in Northern Ireland were actually done by the Republicans. And if you do remember, Tony Blair gave those letters of comfort in the backdoor deal and Queen's pardons of mercy to the IRA. He effectively gave them an amnesty. So we are finding now that unionists who were um, hurt and, and in these troubles are looking for answers that they cannot get. Their relations will never see the answers. And they have looked towards the Republic of Ireland, who have also been involved in collusion or accused of collusion, should I say. Uh, the Smithwick's Tribunal looked at, at, at that. And I caught up with the Taoiseach, the Irish Prime Minister, to ask him about the Ian Sproul family in that Smithwick's Tribunal. It was um, alleged that the Garda Shia Khanna had colluded with the IRA in the murder of Ian Sproul. The Taoiseach has not yet met that family. He says he won't have a problem meeting them. But he also said that the Smithwick's Tribunal had cleared everything up. Uh, listen to these two clips of the Taoiseach and John Sproul, Ian Sproul's brother. Um, and I don't have a difficulty uh, in meeting the Sproul family. And I want to say, I, I have to be very categorical about this. On the legacy issue, the Irish government stood up to the plate in terms of the Smithwick Tribunal, and we saw it through. We started the Smithwick Tribunal, and we saw it through. There can be no hiding place, and the government of the Republic will not shelter or protect anybody in respect of any wrongdoing or any violence uh, imposed on anybody. Uh, so I really would reject any assertion uh, on that front. Hey, uh, he must have a long dairy, because we're going to ask his years, he, emails, letters, and he still hasn't met me. Uh, if he's able to come here tonight to Northern Ireland, he's going to be able to come to Northern Ireland and meet me and all our families. The, the, the collusion come to light, and uh, the Smellick Tribunal uh, were what the six dates said with beyond doubt there was a collusion on my brother's murder. Uh, there have been other collusion in the Republic of Ireland, but uh, as one door after another being closed, and uh, I'm going to keep this fight up until there there's, must be truth and justice, and uh, no comeback from the Republic of Ireland. Uh, what seconds me is they keep chatting about legacy. They're more unable and want to come to Northern Ireland to chat about legacy and blame everybody else. But when it's on their own door, they don't want to talk about it, don't want to meet me, and this must change. Legacy needs to be for everybody, just not the chosen few. Well, there you are, legacy for everybody. So these cases behind us, we're not saying that the past must end. That's what the public are not saying. But what they are saying is that it has to change to be inclusive. When you have shots of a victim's brother standing outside an event that deals with legacy and he's not inside, there's something wrong. Certainly seems to be the case. Such an important story and remarkable that the Irish Taoiseach would refuse to meet with such a victim. Well, Doogie Beatty, thank you so much for bringing us that story. Really important to keep up with that there. Well, that brings us to the end of the programme. You've been watching The Briefing. It's back every weekday from 12. Up next, it's On The Money with Liam Halligan. But first, the weather. Hello, Alex Deacon here with your latest weather from the Met Office. A uh, different feel out there today. It's not as cold as it was, uh, but it is quite a grey day with many of us seeing outbreaks of rain. Here's the reason why low pressure up to the northeast with these two weather fronts in between them, some mild air, but still a lot of isobars across the chart. So it is still a fairly breezy day and there's an awful lot of cloud around as well, bringing rain at times, certainly a wet day for Western Scotland, Northern Ireland. The rain a bit patchier elsewhere. And we do have some breaks in the cloud, a bit of sunshine over southeast Scotland, northeast England, and brightening up at times across parts of southern England and South Wales. And if we see a hint of sunshine, temperatures could easily pop up to 14, 15 degrees. So it is quite a bit warmer than it was for much of last week. During this evening, that rain will continue for Northern Ireland and western parts of Scotland. Again, patchy rain elsewhere, particularly over hills. Uh, but again, largely dry across eastern England. Not much rain across the south.